Hey, welcome to Hear God's Word. This is Michael Weinger. In this podcast, we study and dissect the Bible to better understand what it means and is trying to say. We'll cover theology and dig into the original meaning through language and word studies. We'll even discuss scientific and historical ties, but we'll always come back to the basics. There's so many layers to the Bible, and it's all important. So, if you want to hear what God has to say, then let's dive in. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. So, today we actually have uh, Chuck back on, uh, who was several episodes ago. um, We were talking about deeper meanings in the Bible, so it's good to have you back on, Chuck. It's good to be here, and my last name is not back on. It is Hanson, and I'm glad to be here. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) All righty. So last episode, we were talking about Cain, Abel, and introducing them as people, as the sacrifices that they were offering to God. And it talked about how, which leads into this week, Abel offered his first fruit. And then it says that Cain offered fruit from the ground. And so we were talking about some of the different kind of... Uh, ways that that could be taken, but no matter what, it's clear in the end of verse 5 that God liked and looked at and appreciated or approved of Abel's offering, but he couldn't say the same for Cain's. And um, we were talking right before this, Chuck, and the reason that it says God didn't except Cain's offering is, it doesn't say. No. <laughs> uh, it, Cain, it just says uh, Cain, it doesn't say exactly this, but Cain casually presented some of his crops as a gift mm. to the Lord is kind of what yeah. it infers, you know. Whereas his brother Abel brought the best of his firstborn yeah. lambs of the flock. So, you know, there's there's a distinction that is made in the uh, attention paid to what the gift to God is, you know. Yeah. And, and it I, does seem like, uh, you know, Cain just, you know, grabbed a bag of grain and brought it, you know, in the last minute. Oh, I got to go to the sacrifice. I'll just grab a box of cereal and take that, you know. Yeah, we were talking about how it seems like it had something to do with their attitude difference. And there actually is a equal term for offering your best fruit or grain or whatever kind of fruit he offered. They could have said that Cain offered his first fruits because even other places in scripture, it talks about like bringing our first fruits and it didn't say that Cain did that. So it seems as if it was more so like a quality and effort issue on Cain's part that God didn't appreciate. And um, many times, you know, let's say at a job, if someone gives their best effort as opposed to just doing the bare minimums, I think it's possible that we could maybe compare Cain's effort to Abel's effort here with something along those lines. And um, nonetheless, like we're left with uh, this thing after the offering where Cain ends up getting upset. So, um, I don't know if you have any insights on this, but yeah, while you were thinking about that, I was saying, you know, how can you convey this? Maybe the idea of a vineyard and a winery. Uh, you know, they produce wine, which they sell to the public, and they have different classifications of the wine that they sell. But then there's the stuff that, you know, the grapes were just exceptionally wonderful uh, and sweet, and, uh, you know, the flavor was just totally unique. And the wine that was produced from those grapes, that's like a special edition top shelf stuff that the uh, mm-hmm. general public doesn't take. 
uh, an opportunity to purchase that wine or to even taste it or anything. That's just for the the the, the vineyard owner and his family and his close friends. Let's say uh, you and I could never get a bottle of that wine. Um, yeah. But to put it into the context of what Cain offered to God, just the cheap stuff you would be on sale at Kmart or well, not Kmart doesn't exist. Well, I say at Walmart, you know, the liquor department at Walmart versus, you know, some high end esoteric stuff that maybe the finest restaurants in the world might be lucky to get a bottle of and be able to serve you a glass from. That's what he should have brought to God, you know, mm. the very best that existed, not just yeah. whatever's laying around, you know. Yeah. And obviously they knew that God was worthy of having sacrifices made to him, like either it might have been some kind of sin offering and they they knew that they had to make things right with God, or maybe it was just them offering like a love and peace and free will offering to him. Like no matter what kind of offering it was, you know, offering something to God is the the highest sort of respect that we need to show. Yeah. You know, later in the Psalms, you know, God says through David, you know, the 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 sacrifice that I desire is a what a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Yeah. So it's not the physical thing that you're bringing; it's the heart that you're bringing to the sacrifice that's important to God. Yeah. And uh, speaking of respect, some of the translations actually say that God did not respect Cain's offering, but He respected Abel's. Yeah. So like, when we show disrespect. Obviously, people will disrespect us in return, whether it's right or not. But here, is it saying that God is disrespectful and that he was angry at Cain? Actually, um, it does not say that exactly in this way. Um, it, it actually, like we were talking about last week, uh, it actually says that he didn't gaze upon or like he didn't look at Cain's offering or at least in the same way that Abel did. It doesn't even necessarily say that he was angry with Cain, but just uh, at the very minimum that kind of like the wine example you were talking about, you know, God loved the wine that Abel was offering to him like it was exceptional and he couldn't not pass it up like it was top quality stuff and at the same time Keynes was kind of just uh smashed a couple grapes with his feet threw it in a bottle left it for a day and brought it <laughs> to god like god's like huh I'm going to pass on this. Well, you see a couple of kids in, in, you know, in a, you know, first grade class, you know, there's two kids and the teacher gives them paper and crayons and says, you know, I want you to make your best effort to, to uh, draw a picture of me, you know, and uh, Abel's working away, you know, looking into teacher and doing everything he can in his childish way to make a, you know, a, an image that looks like the teacher. And uh, Cain, otherwise, he just takes a couple of crayons and scratches back and forth and flips it to her and goes, here you go, you know, this is what I think of you, you know. And Not it, very it, highly. Says, this is not acceptable, uh, Cain. I want you to do this over again and, and really work on it and, and put some effort into it and do it right, you know. And it says uh, in the last uh, sentence of the verse, uh, Cain was very angry and he looked mm. dejected because God didn't accept his half-hearted, careless effort wasn't good enough. And God kind of called him out on it. And yeah. he was pissed off about it. You know, literally, that's what it, what it says. And, uh, yeah. um, you know, and, and, you know, is that acting childish and peevish and uh, being filled with pride and arrogance? Yeah, of course, that's what we are, people, you know. And, yeah. You know, Cain and Abel is about people. This is what we are, you know. Yeah, I wanted to make a parallel to my work because... This isn't only talking about offerings, but it, it paints a bigger picture of our behavior and our attitude because as some of you guys, if you've listened to previous episodes, you know that I work with men in recovery 
that are working through drug, alcohol, addictions, and as well as behavior, anger, all this kind of stuff. And there's times where I face issues with guys who they end up doing something half-heartedly, like without much effort. And then I try to peacefully confront them. And uh, this is what we're going to actually end up talking about next. But I, I end up trying to, as kindly as possible, say like, hey, you know, was, uh, was there something wrong with what you did there? Kind of probing to see what's going on with them. And there's times where they've unnecessarily instantly gotten angry to whereas we could have had a peaceable conversation and worked through the stuff that they were struggling with or giving half effort with. It was easier for them to strike back out because they were trying to defend themselves. And it seems as if Obviously, Kane here is getting very defensive and offended that God isn't taking Weld's offering. So before we read this, I just want you guys to maybe think in the back of your mind, do you think he is mainly upset at God? Do you think he is upset at his brother? Like, oh yeah, my brother's a show off, you know, like he offered this stuff to God and God likes him. So like, is Cain more ticked off at God or more ticked off at his brother? Or is it like an equal thing that's <laughs> feeding into this attitude problem that he's obviously striking up? Because the last thing we end on is that it says he was angry and he looked dejected or as we were talking about last like week. Pouting like a little brat kid. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Basically his face fell or his countenance dropped. So essentially... He had a big frown or upset look on his face. His facial expression was down. Yeah, well, he said a little brat kid. You know, you, you little brat kid steals a cookie that he's been told he can't have one until after dinner, and he gets caught, and mom puts him in the corner uh, for a period of time, and he, he's in the corner, he's angry, and he's pouting, and you can't see me raising my hand here. I'm identifying as I, I'm telling my own story here about one thing that happened as a child. And, uh, you know, I, I was angry that I got caught. Uh, you know, I, I was angry not only at my mother, but at myself because I did something uh, stupid and got myself in trouble. And mm. because of my pride, I literally backed myself into a corner that I can't get out of, except by, you know, heartfelt, deeply... Uh, sincere apology to my mother for taking the cookie it would have worked she would she yeah. loved me she you know yeah. she would have folded like a lawn chair you know if i'd done that but i was too proud to do that you know i was defiant you know yeah like, you know well yeah i got caught but so what you know you're you're wrong you know you shouldn't you shouldn't care that I, I whatever i thought was good enough should have been good enough you know instead of you yeah. uh you know coming at me and and you rejected didn't accept didn't honor didn't uh um, uh, approve of what I brought to you as an offering. Yeah. And I, I know probably many of you already are aware of the story or have read ahead, uh, even if this is your first time uh, going through the Bible with us. Um, but another question uh, to keep in mind is that, like, is Cain going to end up uh, apologizing to God and and trying to offer something better or have That's a change of attitude. That's yeah, what God wanted Cain to see that he was wrong and admit it. You know, God's not hard to deal with. Uh, it's very simple, but it's it's not easy to deal with God because He requires you know absolute honesty. Hmm. When, if we have a problem with anything as a human race, it's being absolutely honest. You know, uh, and and all. Uh, um, with all respect to uh, 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 Adam and Eve, when they got caught sinning, eating apples in the Garden of Eve, uh, Eden a few chapters prior to this, uh, God asked Adam, what have you done? You know, here's a, yeah. here's a, you just laid it out on a golden rug for Adam. Just tell me what you did and say you're sorry. And yeah. uh, things will, you know, we he could fix this, you know. 
But instead of, you know, admitting his culpability, Adam immediately pointed at Eve and said, she's the one who tricked me into doing it, and you made her, so it's your fault, God, you know? And That's then literally what, what the, the thing was. And then I went right down the chain, then God looks at Eve, and she was, not my fault, it's the serpent, <laughs> and you made the serpent, so it's your fault again, you know? And God must have, oh boy, you know, you knuckleheads, you know, I get <laughs> You leave me no choice, you know. I, I I can't tolerate this. So he banned them from the Garden of Eden, and this mm. whole mess that we have that we call life on Earth is a result of of uh, the humans' uh, uh, predilection to lying as the first response to anything. You know? So what's going to happen? To denial. Pain, like yeah. <laughs> denial. You know. Is uh, Cain going to follow in the footsteps of his parents? So. Um, would you mind reading starting in verse six, Chuck? Yeah. And by the way, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, we're reading from the New Living Translation or the NLT. And this is chapter four, verse six of Genesis. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Now, in retrospect, sitting here today, reading this, thinking about it, that was really good advice, you know, to Cain. Yeah. All you have to do is, you know, own up to your behavior, correct it, do the right thing, and be diligent to be careful, you know, the sin has found a way to to get into get under your skin, sin under your skin. <laughs> How about that? You know, made a new saying, mm. you know. Um, yep. You know, Cain, listen, you know, listen to me, you know, said you gotta be careful, man. You know, this this is gonna destroy you if you don't get a handle on it and get control of this thing. Yeah. That's the basic message if we were to some just what we're talking about today up in a nutshell it's that right there is they um we could even point back to adam and eve again right after they did something that they knew was something they weren't supposed to do like here cain is offering an offering that he knew wasn't up to par and yet instead of having a response like you were talking about of being humble and admitting yeah i didn't give my best you know let me let me try again and um uh, i'll come back and offer something like i'm i'm sorry instead uh it talks about how he's getting angry upset and in verse six, that, that's the the nature of man when it's pointed out to us, mm -hmm. either by someone we know, or you know, in this case, by God Himself. We resent, you know, what that implies to us that we're we are corrupt and dirty and you know filthy and unrighteous and all this stuff that we know that we are. Mm -hmm. And now here's somebody who's actually saying it, and we don't like hearing it. Yeah, and. You know? And just like Adam and Eve, they were questioned. And like I was talking about with some of the guys I, I work in recovery, you know, I asked them, hey, what's going on? You know, I don't even accuse them right away. Like God's not even accusing Cain. He's just asking him, hey, why are you so down? He's not attacking Cain, but yet Cain is still becoming upset and defensive nonetheless. And right that we do have that uh, proneness and tendency. Like God didn't even accuse Adam and Eve right away. He simply asked, Hey guys, where are you at? <laughs> he didn't even come right at it. What did you do? You ate from the tree. I told you not to. He didn't come yelling and screaming in like a angry parent. He came gently probing into the situation, trying to see if they would own up to what happened well i'll go back to the garden of eden when god came to the garden he knew what had happened he knew they were hiding in the bushes and they'd made these ridiculous 
coverings uh, to hide their nakedness and everything. And he's, you who Adam and Eve, where are you? Come on out. And they come out and he doesn't say something harsh or anything to him. He pleads, he has his voice is pleading. What have you done? You know, yeah. what have you done? You know, cause he, he knows the implications and the results of this unrepented sin, you know, and he's uh, beg, he doesn't go into a dissertation explaining what repentance and forgiveness is all about, but he just, you know, come clean, tell me what kids, what happened, you know, tell me what happened, you know, and they start lying and making stories up. And uh, you've done this yourself, dear listener, and uh, I've done it myself. And um, and I, I love children because they're so pure and innocent. But if you a child gets caught in the act of doing something wrong, they're going to deny it, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, 99 out of 100 times, you might have a rare instance where a kid will, you know, own up to it, you know, and usually then they just start bawling and yeah. you know, trying to get sympathy out of you because uh, they feel bad, you know, but uh, uh, most often it's a denial, you know, and uh, that's, you know, that's the nature we're wired with you know that's the nature that we bring to the foot of the cross with us and uh it's that nature that, that god wants to destroy in us and in its place uh, create in us a clean heart you know that's what god wants to do but if we refuse to admit who and what we really are how's he going to do that you know he, he is an absolute gentleman and will never violate our will our choice whatever we choose he honors that and listen to that carefully. You know, if you choose your pride over the Holy Spirit ruling your heart, the Holy Spirit will never rule your heart. Pride will. Until you can put that aside and give God permission to ascend to the throne of your heart. Yeah. That's a little off the story of Cain and Abel, but it's a direct consequence of the reality of the story. Yeah. And um, even though we won't get to, any sort of consequences this week as we were reading it's it's like we were talking about the whole adam and eve parallel where right now just these few verses six through eight is god's conversation talking to cain and so far cain hasn't really responded in any sort of way he's just taking in what god is speaking to him and so we're going to leave a cliffhanger at the end on what happens. And again, most of you probably know what's coming next, but we'll leave that and kind of hint at it. But I really want to focus in on how Cain is even reacting while God is talking to him. Like we talked about how his face you know, dropped it. He was both down internally, but the thing is, it says it was even on his face that like his face looked dejected. Like you could tell he was angry and upset about something. And I know that... I think my analogy of a pouting little brat, you know, fits fits the picture correctly, you know, because it's kind of the same thing, you know? Yeah. as adults, we don't, you know, pout and stamp our feet so much. Um, most of us don't. Some of us do, you know. But uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, Cain, like you were saying, uh, it showed in his character. And God is able to discern the heart, not just the appearance, you know. And he knew there was trouble brewing in Cain. Yeah. That's why he, his next uh, sentence is, you know, to warn him about yes. the dangers of of letting sin get into his being and take over because that's going to destroy him. Yeah. God is even gracious enough, just like he gave Adam and Eve the warning. Cain hasn't fully necessarily done anything wrong. He kind of just (laughs) half-heartedly gave a sacrifice. So like what he did seems like it wasn't up to par, but God is saying, like, watch out so that you don't sin. So it seems as if he hasn't, like, fully committed any sort of sin or wrong at this point, but he's heading in that direction. Like, you know, a little bit of half effort here, a little bit there, you know, next thing you know, uh, you're 
you know, blowing off work and lying to your employer, and then you're doing something intentionally wrong. And so this is what God is trying to warn yep. Cain. Cain you know, literally just didn't do as good as he could have, you know, and, and God knew that he could, he was capable of far better than what he did. And he just said, you know, I want you to go back and mm. you know, work on this and bring me the, your best, Cain. Come on, yeah. you know, what what's with this stuff you brought? You know, give me the best you got, mm. you know. I heard a great quote yesterday from one of my leaders at my workplace. One of my coworkers used this quote that it's better as a leader to call people up as opposed to just calling them out of something. And here that goes right along with what you were saying. God is trying to call Cain up to something better. And actually it says in verse seven, you will be accepted if you do what is right. That word actually in Hebrew means to lift up. And so, like, basically, God is saying, like, you'll actually be elevated and lifted up. Like, you'll be doing even better if you, you know, do what is good and right. And, like, that's what God was looking for in the first place. Like, he was looking for something good. And, like, it, it's yeah. clear that Cain didn't offer, <laughs> like, what was good for one reason or another. You look at this story and you see, you know, what what principles of godliness did did Cain, you know, uh, sidestep, and and one of them is the the very first of the Ten Commandments carved in stone. I I am Yahweh your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And Cain had uh, brought his own reasoning, his own intellect, his own uh, perceptions to a higher plane than what God required of him. God required, you know, his perfect sacrifice, the best he could bring, and he just brought whatever, you know. So he thought in his mind that, you know, my attitude, my understanding, that's superior to what God has required of me. Yeah. And, and, you know, and you could link in, you know, ways other commandments that he had uh, violated. Adam and Eve would, after what they experienced, they learned their lesson. They would never, ever again do anything like this to, uh, to violate what God has has given to them as a command. You know, and if God asks you to do something, it's not really a request. It's kind of like a, a command because it's God asking for it. You know, yeah. So uh, to not adhere to that, you know, and to honor that. Uh, that's showing a lot of uh, um, a lot of things were wrong with the uh, yeah. cane. You know? When when you were talking about commands, uh, we've talked before how at least I think that instructions is the best term in English to describe uh, because even if you look in a concordance for you know, a Hebrew to English translation of what the word tzavah, uh, which means command or instruction, means like instruction is one of those translations. And like the interesting uh, thing about that is um, like instructions can be both a positive thing, like here, do this, do that. You know, he gave them actually positive instruction in the garden. Hey, you guys can eat from this and that tree, like that is actually viewed as like, technically it said in the verse right before of it, that like he commanded them to eat from the trees. So he was giving them like positive instructions. Many times we just think of negative instructions. Don't steal, don't kill, don't uh, eat poor, uh, and the list goes on. But there's good things that God warns and even let me here, tell you a story about this. Uh, many years ago, I heard a pastor who was talking about the Ten Commandments, and he says it's it's much easier to understand what the commandments really are if you take what uh, when Jesus was asked what's the most important commandment, and he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And if you prefix each of the Ten Commandments with that, if I love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul. I will have no other gods before him. They're, they're actually promises, you know, and God will provide the power to obey his 
commands, uh, and they become promises of God's yeah. grace and mercy and, and love in us if we allow it. Yeah. And that's the key. We have to allow God to do these wonderful things in our life. If we insist on going our own way, you know, you can sing that Frank Sinatra song, you know, to the grave. You know, I did it my way and he mm. will allow you to do it. You know, yeah, he won't stop you, you know, but uh, he'll try and stop you. He, if you think, you know, all through your life, he's been there jumping up and down, raving, waving red flags, trying to get your attention. But we just blindly plunge ahead doing our thing, you know? Yeah. And um, that that leads straight into to sin, which is going to be honestly one of the biggest topics in the Bible. It's one of the largest topics of discussion, like especially uh, among Christians, which we'll get to that in a few minutes, like tying up what we were talking about, the instructions. And I was just thinking about uh, what you were saying, you know, if Adam and Eve would have been thinking, you know, even though they didn't have the Ten Commandments on stone that Moses and all of them had, they still knew they weren't supposed to have, you know, other gods. They they knew who the one God was at that point, and they uh, like knew that there were other gods, but there was uh, the one God, Yahweh, who was the one responsible for creating them and the heavens and the earth. And if they would have taken that principle of the first commandment and been like, you know, I, I love God, so I'm not going to have other gods. So the snake is telling me I can become like one. Well, I, I don't need to do that because if I become one, then like, why do I need <laughs> the the God I already have? You know, and obviously that didn't work to their benefit. And I think we can all say when we try to ascend to godhood, all of us are failures yeah. <laughs> at, at that uh, task or achievement. And like the the crazy thing is God already made them in his image. They already had some of, uh, I guess, godhood in them because they were made like him. They didn't have to eat a fruit and elevate themselves even more because obviously it didn't work to their benefit. All it caused them was pain, misery, and our suffering even. And so, it seems like we all have a selective memory. You know, uh, Adam and Eve were both told what to do and what not to do in regard to the tree with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. And along comes Satan and he misrepresents what God had said. And instead of uh, of Eve uh, reiterating what God had said, she began arguing with Satan over his misrepresentation of what God had said, not coming from a place of the truth, you know, mm. just her own wisdom and understanding. Yeah. And when we try and match wits with Satan, we are toast mm. right then and there. It's not going any further. He's won at that point. Yeah. As soon as we think in our own intellect and our own skills that we're a match for him, we're done, you know? Yeah. That he's got us, you know, just because we entered into that engagement with him, he's got us, you know? Yeah. There's it's a matter of time then. You know? One last example of the instructions that I think works perfectly. So God is like the manufacturer, like he manufactured this world. And just as a manufacturing company, you know, they, for example, the other day I was building a shoe rack uh, that we set up in our home and the manufacturer had some instructions. Now, if I tried building that thing myself, it would have never come together. <laughs> or I tell you when it's real bad, when you get like an Ikea and there's two left sides to a cabinet, oh. and not the right side. <laughs> oh. Why wouldn't I try it in every possible way and it doesn't work? And I don't have the right part to make it work. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, th that's uh, the, the whole point I was going to make, though, that when we follow the manufacturer's instructions, he made everything and he knows how it fits together. 
Yeah. Like yeah. when we follow the directions and the instructions or the in, law. In my IKEA case, the first instruction is to lay out all the parts and make sure that you have everything exactly as it's listed. Mm. Okay, that's what it says. I didn't do that. I just went to putting it together and one of the parts was wrong and it wouldn't go together, you know? Mm. And when I, you know, later after repacking everything, I'm looking at the instructions and, you know, now, there it is right there. You know, if I would have just looked, I would have wow. seen there was two A's instead of an A and a B or whatever it was, you know, and yep. uh, I the didn't follow direction. The manufacturer put it all there for you. You just didn't put it all it together. Like, yeah, you know, do you have any brains? Will you read the instructions? Oh, well, I don't got no brains. I don't need them. I'm yeah. a guy. I'll put this together. <laughs> yeah. Humility. That was, this is, I think, the theme of what we're talking about here. The... The humility to not get upset and to not get down. I, I have to say, when I was putting the shoebox together, I actually flipped one of the things the wrong way. One of the panels, uh, it even said on the directions, I was trying to pay close attention, but it said, make sure that it's facing this specific way. So I kind of skimmed over that direction and I had to pay for it like, yeah. 15 minutes later and take the piece apart. I was getting really frustrated because then the pieces weren't coming back out. And uh, so we suffer frustration <laughs> many times when we don't do things right. And this is a lesson for us. You know, God asked, you know, what what's wrong, Cain? And in that moment, um, so this is a, a little bit of, you know, my own experience, which hopefully it helps you guys. I, I stopped. He literally says, you know, Cain, you know, why, why the sour face? I said, Cain, you know, if you just do what I told you to, everything's going to be all right. You know, go, go do it the way I told you and bring it to me, you know, and, you know, I'm God. I'm the one who asked for the sacrifice. If I say it's going to be okay, if you do it this way, you can take that to the bank. It's going to be okay. Just listen to me. Yeah. It, it did turn out okay. Like I ended up calming down and i i did end up praying my my wife had left she'd helped me with the first few steps and then that's when i realized i'd made a mistake i was alone i was getting frustrated and i asked god like please help calm me down and help me finish this by the time my wife gets home i ended up calming down i took the pieces apart they they came out not as uh, difficult as I was making it as at first when I was more flustered and I got it all put yeah. together with not as much of a problem. At that I point thought. when you wanted to take a hammer and just turn this into, you know, campfire. Wood yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of <laughs> wanted to just slam it down, return it, be like, I'm just giving up on it. They, they made all these pieces stupid and uh, like, yeah, uh, like this is the manufacturer's fault. They may, yeah, you know, that their instructions are poor, and but that wasn't necessarily the problem. It was obviously, you know, on me, and I had some stuff I had to learn and work through. And Kane has this opportunity too, right now. He, God was literally loving on Kane, you know, in, in the practical demonstration of what is loving on. This was loving on him. Is, you yeah. know, he's trying to correct him and, and show him the right way, yeah. you know, the path of righteousness, you know, of obedience and uh, the best way, you know, because mm -hmm. look, you know, we didn't get into it here, but later in the chapter, it talks about the consequences of mm -hmm. this that all rained down on Cain's head and uh, the disaster that uh, his life became. It's a result of this resistance to God, you know? Yeah. Maybe at some point down the road, he might have realized, you know, man, I wish I would have listened to God back when I had a chance to, you know? But once you, you cross the line into sin, there's consequences. Yeah. And God can heal the punishment and take that away like it never happened. But the consequences, no, they're there. King David learned that the hard way with his... Uh, his children, you know, who rebelled against him and uh, uh, the, the baby that died and, you know, all this, this, these terrible consequences as a result of his sin. But God totally forgave David and honored him and restored him and uh, blessed him in so many ways. But 
he still had to bear the consequences of sin, you know, that he committed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, that's why God was so adamant, leading with Cain. Don't don't go down this road. You know, you you can't see what's going to happen. I can. You know, don't do this. Uh, you know, listen to me. Yeah, I, I'm your father. I love you. You know, I created you. You know, come back to me. You know, and honor me. Obey me. Let me guide your way. Yeah, and boy, do we fight against that. You know, every one of us individually have been given that opportunity by God, and we choose instead to do it our way, you know? Yeah. And we make a total mess out of things, and then we see the wisdom of what God is telling us, you know? Yeah, in retrospect, sadly. Yes. yes, you've told me beating my head against the wall would hurt, <laughs> and I did it, and yeah, I got a big <laughs> lump, I agree, you're right, it hurts, you know? <laughs> And God smiles and nods his head, so, you know, I'm not going to say I told you so, but, you know, yeah. next time, listen. You know? that, I, hopefully we learn from mm -hmm. those experiences. And uh, I've learned a little to listen, but I still have the tendency to, you know, my way is the right way. Mm. I wanted to go in one different direction and then also we're going to go back to verse six and and finish up talking about the whole countenance or the the face or facial expression sort of issue with Cain. but i wanted to discuss abel for a second like notice that he's absent from the story right now i was just thinking about it right now and Many times when someone does the right thing, usually they're left out of the story or they end up becoming, I guess you could say, a background character in, in a situation. For example, if you were doing something good, but your little brother Joe was misbehaving, your, your parent isn't going to focus on you. They're not going to turn their head to you. They're going to end up you know, turning their head to your little brother, Joe, and talking with him. And many times uh, I was thinking even of the story um, of the prodigal son. There was the one son that, you know, was with the father and he wasn't doing anything wrong. Like the story doesn't even talk about him till the end. Yeah. And then when it does talk about him, it's because he's acting like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's when the father turns his yeah, face now back to the son. jealous of the prodigal son. You know? Yeah. If he would have just been content and obedient as a good son, he yeah. never would have been in the story at all. But yeah. What was the old saying in the newspapers? If it bleeds, it leads, you know, as far mm. as selecting what stories are or people want to read about it. It's, mm. it's the horrible stuff, you know, the fire where people are burned to death. That's, That's what people want to read about. They don't want to read about, you know, somebody finding a lost puppy and returning it, you know. Yeah. The humanity of that story is incredible. You know, just, yeah, it's, it's nice things, you know. We, we want to, you know, read something horrible and salacious, you know. Yeah. We actually, we want to read about the pastor getting caught in adultery and stuff like that. That's what we want, you know. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's the way it is. You know? Yeah. And I think we, even though don't have anything specifically said or taught about this here, I think we could agree that it's a good and okay thing to stay out of trouble. Like you don't have to be in the headline. You don't have to have a horrible story of addiction in the past to actually have a good life story. Uh, you don't have to do all of these horrible things to still have a good life. And a, a lot of times, you know, God is looking for people like he's looking for Cain to, you know, not have to be in this situation in the first place. Right. If we heard a testimony like, you know, I was born into a wonderful Christian family. I, I learned to uh, obey and follow God as a youth and all through my uh, you know, school years and adult life and everything. I always honored and obeyed God and I've never fallen into any sin or anything like that. And, you know, now I'm 95 years old <laughs> laying on my deathbed and, you know, the angels are in my attendance, you know, and my, all of my family and descendants are all here. And we're all happy about the wonderful opportunity I've had to live this great life of obedience to God. And, everybody be boring yeah. you know? <laughs> no but isn't that true yeah, yeah. like you know no one's focusing on Cain or or the guy who lives a 
a, a good life, staying out of trouble. So many times that person gets overshadowed. But in the end, isn't that what everyone in trouble is trying to achieve? They're trying to to be like, man, I, I wish I actually wasn't involved in all the chaos and drama that I'm in. Like, I wish that God wasn't half having to constantly discipline me or having to correct me, you know, like none of us enjoy that. And I think like we could even say at work when we're constantly making a scene or getting in trouble or having to be talked to at work, we don't enjoy that kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with saying, yeah, I had a good day at work. It was peaceful. I got a lot done. Like I'm happy about what I did. I, I think that that's in, at the end of the day, something that actually we all kind of wish we had or could do. Like there still is something good in like making the most, like Abel made the most of his sacrifice. And I'm sure he was really proud, but at the same time, it's easy to get overshadowed. Like you were talking about and be like, oh, the headline though, is that Cain offered uh, a less, uh, lesser or subpar sacrifice. And now he's angry. What's he going to do next? Seems a uh, drama is attractive to us, you know, at some level. And, uh, uh, maybe it's because uh, we don't feel so all alone in our own darkness and sin, you know, that we can, mm. you know, draw some comfort from the fact that there's so much evil going on in the world that uh, our evil is not that significant by itself, you know, because there's so much out there, you know. But uh, uh, unfortunately, God doesn't deal with the world at all. He deals with us as individuals, you know, so... Uh, that's just a, you know, it's a lie. It's a misconception that the devil puts in our head, you know, that, uh, you know, I'm not the only one. There's others, you know, that are guilty like me, you know, so that that somehow lessens my responsibility and the punishment that I rightfully deserve. I know I deserve it, you know, and that's why I feel this way about things. You know, it's, it's because I understand, you know, that, uh, on some level, maybe not at a conscious awareness level, but somewhere in me, there's this saying saying that what you've done is wrong, you know, and it has to be made right. And, you know, when you become aware of it and you, you know, say, uh, well, you know, there's no way I can make this right. Well, there is one way it can be made right, and that's the way of the cross that Jesus took on our behalf. He made it right. He did for us what we're not capable of doing, and that's making right the impossible wrong with God. You know, he is the one who has the authority to forgive sin as if it didn't ever happen. Now, the consequences of our sin don't go away, but the guilt of our sin is transferred and accepted by Christ. He takes it away from us if we give it to him. He won't take it without our permission. Yeah. And, and that means we have to admit it, to confess it. Yeah. We have to repent of it. If we don't do that, it's still there. It's not dealt with. And we're fooling ourselves to think that it is. So you, you are, are called to step up and be absolutely honest with yourself. Now, Peter lived a life of delusion and confusion. He thought he was a great follower of Christ. Everybody else did too. He was like the leading disciple. Then in the garden of the, of the uh, chief priest, when he denied Christ for the third time that night, the rooster crowed and Peter looked at Jesus and Jesus was looking at him. And he wasn't wagging his finger and condemning him. See, look, I told you so. You know, his was just utter compassion. And he's just like, I'm sorry, Peter, you have to go through this, but you got to deal with the truth, you know. Then cascading through Peter's mind came all these images and instances where he was just being a hypocrite, where he was being full of himself and full of pride. And I'm Peter, the mighty, what he cut the priest's ear off. Or this is, you know, everything was about me, me, me. It was all about Peter, you know. And Peter saw himself for what he really was at that moment. And it just broke his heart. I mean, Peter just ran away weeping. Because a moment before, he'd sworn on his family's honorable name 
that I don't know this guy. I don't know who he is. I'm not his follower. Yeah. I want to come back to actually something uh, just as serious that Jesus pointed out with Peter at one point. Um, we'll come back to that because uh, we'll we'll wrap up by talking about this issue of sin and like you were hitting some really deep and um like um like topics that that really cover the uh, a lot of the crux of why this book is even written down in the first place like god is trying to warn cain here about his sin which is what i was saying like uh we'll end up talking about a little bit more in a minute uh, i wanted to just uh for a minute shift gears and finish talking about the whole countenance thing we've been talking about and then we'll come back to this so many times when you see someone you know walking down the street or uh, anywhere at work um, or even when they come home from work and you see a certain facial expression you can right away recognize that and we were just talking about that a few minutes ago you can kind of tell what kind of state someone is in just by looking at their face and uh, i've heard an expression that you know the eyes or the face is a a gateway or a window into someone's soul or like seeing more things about them and you can see when someone's angry when someone's down you can see when a little kid obviously is upset and they have that pouty face mm -hmm. <laughs> you can tell a lot of things just by someone's expression and oh yeah the phrases like red with anger or green with envy mm -hmm. uh, you know um, these are you know perceptions that are you know available to people that are somewhat sensitive i mean if you're mm -hmm. just all wrapped up in your own stuff you don't even notice but you know if you're sensitive to what's going on around you and you see this in people uh you know it's, it's a real thing you know it, mm -hmm. it's uh if your heart is deeply, you know, angry, if you're filled with murderous hate, it shows, you know, I mean, you know, to, to someone who's sensitive, they see it in your countenance, it's there, you know, there's something wrong. Yeah. And so now I wanted to tie back in what we were talking about with sin before, like, why does it matter, you know, that Cain's face is down, like he's upset, um, you know, just as uh if you would have come over today chuck when we we're when we we're recording this and you were looking really down the first thing i would have asked you kind of like god asked like hey why do you look so down or as it says here why do you look so dejected and so far we don't have a, a response from yeah, kane but it's not like some the, annoying guy at the office who's asked this is god who you yeah. know personally and this is god he's asking yeah. you you know we'll yet at the same time i was thinking about how when we're questioned when we're in a bad attitude sometimes it does get annoying or we have a turn off sort of response that makes us get even more upset and so in one sense uh it seems as if in a way god is kind of fueling Cain's fire not like on purpose he's not throwing gasoline on it but he is more so trying to get at and and dig at what's going on with Cain to help Cain recognize this thing because like as we were talking about he's trying to warn him of something yeah, well, that's what i meant when he's come. loving all over him you know he's just as, a, yeah. as an act of love he's trying to prevent this yeah. tragedy from happening yeah and and if you would have come in and you you would have uh, just seen me with my head down and i open the door and uh, i go and sit down and i'm not talking much you'd be like hey michael you know is there something wrong today um i could have you know a couple responses i could just 
you know, get irritated and fueled up more. Or I could be like, ah, oh, you know, Chuck cares about me. He loves me. And he's trying to ask me questions to like dig this thing out so I can work through it. And God is trying to help Cain here in this situation. We do this in our own feeble way when our, our friend or you know, our spouse or somebody is is upset in some way. And, you know, we try and fix it by offering some suggestion or whatever. And uh, most of the time, we really don't know what we're talking about. You know, we don't really know what they're feeling. But, you know, in this case, God does know how to fix it. He does know what's bothering them. I mean, he's got the exact recipe to make everything right. And, um, you know, in this case, sadly for Cain, he uh, allowed his... Uh, uh, his pride, his arrogance, his rebellion to, you know, get in the way of listening to God, doing what's right. Hmm. So let's discuss this one verse, which the whole warning that God's giving him is hinging on. And it even appears later, even in places as far as the New Testament about like watching out for stuff that's at your door, like lying and, and waiting for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's reread verse seven. It says, you will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and master it. And so right there, this is one of the most important concepts, I think, that we can take away even for the whole rest of the Bible, something that Adam and Eve could have, <laughs> you know, taken to heart. But now he's trying to help Cain even before he messed up. Yeah. And how many times, you know, have you experienced that either voice or sense that, man, like I know what I'm about to do or what I'm thinking of doing or like what I'm feeling, you know, isn't good. It's not leading to a good place. Um, and I, I wanted to make the connection to Cain's uh, facial expressions, like mirroring how he was actually doing inside, like because it had dropped, like some of the versions translate it, like his, his face had fallen, which is kind of a funny way to say it. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, uh, I thought of this phrase when I was reading it. If you, um, and, and we'll, we'll just give away the cliffhanger right now. Essentially, Cain is on the verge of doing something really, really horrible. So I was thinking of in the book of Daniel, I forget the, the king's name, but, you know, he's throwing his big party and all of a sudden this invisible hand materializes and starts writing on the wall in front of him and it says his countenance changed and his knees smote together. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he didn't know what it said, but he knew it wasn't good. You know? <laughs> yeah. And um, with, with that, uh, I came up with this really catchy phrase, kind of like you were talking about with what was the skin one? Uh, the sin and skin. skin under your skin or sin under your skin. Yeah. So uh, the phrase that I came up with and it hit me really deep when I realized this concept that like, this is what part of what the scripture is trying to get at here is when your face has fallen, you better watch out because it's not long before you will fall. And yeah, good point, you know. So God is trying to give him the warning. Like this ties both things together. Like, why does it matter that he's down? Why is God trying to help him? Like, why do you care? Uh, like, why would you care if I was down when, when I came here? Because you don't want to see me go down a darker path, right? Like, what if the next day, you know, I, I go into a deep depression and you don't hear from me again for a while? Yeah, yeah. It's a warning, warning sign, 
Yeah. You you know, you've you've stepped onto the pathway that leads to destruction and you know it, but you're not turning back. And that's why you have this dejected look on your face that you're, you know, you're enslaved to uh, a course uh, uh, that's it's evil that will bring no good and you know it. Yeah. But you're committed to it, so you're not turning back, you know. So hopeless is another, you know, word that pops up into my mind along with this is hopeless look like I'm trapped by my own poor choices, you know. Mm. But I'm too proud to admit that, so I'm just going to go with it. Yeah. And so here we we have God loving and trying to help him. God is trying to rescue him, but rescue him from what? it. Seems as if in verse seven, like that there is something dangerous and that is sin crouching at his door. Like he he's not alone. It there is this totally like seemingly independent thing that is waiting for him. Like it says, like here just crouching, like waiting for to, as it says, control him. And so uh, let's talk about like this element of sin. We're going to probably talk about it a million times on this podcast <laughs> as the years go on. But um, could you talk a little bit uh, about sin and like especially how it is you know, a, a separate element from just Cain himself. Like he has this thing that seems to be part of him, but yet it's something that seems like it's separate. That's like waiting for him to fall or to like get control of him and his desires. Well, you know, a lot pertains to this. What is the word sin? You know, and the, in the Greek, uh, the word that is translated into sin refers to archery and missing the target or missing the mark. And while that does apply overall to the concept of what sin is, it's certainly missing the mark. But really what sin is, is more uh, specifically defined by uh, John in the first epistle. It says, sin is a transgression of the law or iniquity. Mm -hmm. Yep, is the transgression of the law is the same as the word iniquity. So it, it says uh, uh, during there the judgment, iniquity synonyms. was found in him. That means that, you know, yeah, it's a choice of synonyms that you have. But understanding what they all are gives you, you know, a better conception of what sin is. And uh, sin is uh, specifically, it's doing exactly what God told you not to do. That's what sin is. Yeah. You boil it down, you know. If, whether you're aware of it or not, you know, it's the old saying, ignorance of the law is no excuse, uh, as, as what I was told as a kid. Uh, and that's the truth, you know, just because you, you don't fully understand the ramifications of what God is telling you not to do, you still know he's telling you not to do it, whether you understand it or you, uh, through your own uh, human devices, come up with your reasoning to why it's okay to do it and stuff isn't going to fly. It's still sin, you know, and sin is a horrible thing. You know, the consequences of sin are awful. And that's why God pled with Cain to come clean, you know, to own up, you know, stand up, man up on this, you know, admit that you did this and ask for forgiveness. I can fix it. Yeah. But, you know, I can't do it without your permission and your cooperation. You know, I can't just come in and make it all right. And, uh, and that would be violating your free will. I can't do that. I'm God. And I promise that I wouldn't do that. And my promises never fail. So I can never make an exception. There is no exception today. Christ paid the price for the violation of the law. That's what the law demanded. Blood sacrifice, death. And Christ did it in our place, but it still happened. The death for sin, uh, that price was paid by the only way it could be mm -hmm. without our destruction. So we have a choice. We can be ultimately totally destroyed or we can allow the death of Christ to pay for the sins that we've committed. Yeah. To make the slate clean. 
And that's the only way it happens. He's the only one who has the authority to do it. The law is uh, unshakable. It's immovable. It's, it was carved in stone, literally. And, you know, it cannot be changed. So if we violate the law, the penalty has to be paid. But the provision exists that somebody else can pay the penalty for us. It still has to be paid, but somebody else can pay it. And someone did, you know. Uh, if you want to appropriate that disposition of your sin casually and then just go on living with, uh, oh, I, now I don't need to obey, you know, the law. The law was nailed to the cross. No, the offense of the law, your lawlessness was nailed to the cross. But your obedience to the law from now on is absolutely required. Otherwise, you made the death of Christ of no effect. You, you make uh, his death open shame if you live in sin and just shrug your shoulders. Mm. It's not that important. You know? mm. No, it just yeah. took God himself becoming a human being and dying in your place to make it right. It's not that important. It is that important. You know? Yeah. We, we all know that when we do something wrong, there needs to be some way of making it right. And even as kids, you know, we do things such as having the kid apologize to the person they did wrong to. And obviously we don't have in our culture the practice of sacrificing offerings to pay for our sin, but even in the sense of the legal system, there there's even a fine and a payment. Like you you pay and you you, you do your time and also you, you probably pay money as well. Or someone pays for you and can can bail you out. And that's the concept of what you were talking about where where Jesus made a way possible for whoever believes in him that he paid that price for them because if we added up all of our offenses like there's no way we can bail ourselves out of the the stuff that we've done wrong no we're, our situation is quite hopeless without Christ you know uh, all of humanity is you know we're beyond redemption in our own uh strength and uh, uh, resources. We just can't, we can't pay the, the fine that's been levied against us, let's say. Uh, even our own life now won't balance things out. You know, it's not enough. Only the life of one who is absolutely innocent yeah. of any guilt is good enough to make things right. And when you think of uh, what sin, all the crazy, sick, evil crap in this world is a result of one act of disobedience a long time ago, but just one disobedience to what God had said to do. And we have all of this suffering and uh, evil that's taken place. Add every, everything nasty and horrible that humans have done all together. Uh, and, you know, the list is just overwhelming. It's just sickening, you know, but it's all the result of one act of disobedience, you know. So when, you know, we casually talk about sin, uh, I've heard even pastors say, oh, you don't have to worry that much about sin. We all do it, you know. Mm. We can't stop, you know. Um, Would this be a good time to reveal uh, what Cain is about to do? Well, yeah. yeah I suppose <laughs> if nobody is uh, not looking at their Bible, uh, it's a all right. mess, you know. Yeah, go ahead. So Cain... In the very next verse, it says, One day, Cain suggested to his brother, Let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Yeah. Some say, you know, wasn't, wasn't Abel kind of naive, you know, but uh, if you think about it, at the time, there was no dishonesty. There were no con men. There were no... Uh, people didn't lie, you know, there was no real lying or anything going on. So 
why would you mistrust anybody? You know, there's there's not a reason in the world why you would have any reason to doubt or mistrust anybody. And even if so, it was his brother and he probably gave him a reasonable reason to go out into the field. Uh, no, I was like, what's that axe in your hand, Kane? Well, uh, you're going you're to find out, Abel. <laughs> you uh, steps here. And you'll, I'll show you what it's all about, you know. But it, it goes to uh, what we were saying. Even someone with the lowest of conscience can agree that murder and intentionally killing someone on your own terms for no justified reason is just flat out wrong. Like there's nothing you can do to make up for something like that. And God, after this, we'll, we'll find out what happens and talk about that afterwards in the future. But in the same way where Adam and Eve, you know, deserved to die because they had just committed a very serious offense, like as you were talking about. And um, I, I want to tie in, like technically the word sin is never used in the Adam and Eve story, but we know that the concept of sin did occur, that they did commit that sort of offense, like they missed. Well, it is used in the story, but it's not, you know, um, rendered in the King James as sin, but, you know, it's in verse or, 7, I think. Uh, yeah, watch out, sin is a, is crouching at the door. You know? I was talking about, yeah, in the Adam and Eve story, the word technically wasn't used, but the concept is there. And, you know, um, just as God had given this warning, he's like, hey, watch out, because you're going to die, Adam and Eve. Uh, he's telling Cain, like, hey, watch out. Like here we see, like oh, we can see the punishment from Adam and Eve. Like they lost the ability to be able to live forever, to be able to eat from the tree of life, which possibly would have continued to sustain them, but they lost access to this goodness. And, you know, now we have what we have and experience and know in this broken and painful and fallen world you know we call it the story of the fall for a reason like here kind of like the the phrase i was yeah. saying he used to live in a state of uh, continual communion in the presence of god and harmony with god now when they look back to where they used to live there's angels with flaming swords now between god and man you know mm -hmm. and it's my fault that that's the case you know yeah, my children, they can't mm. go walk in the garden with God like I did, you know, because of what I did, you know. Yeah. That weighs on me. That's that's on me. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to bring up uh that very point. Like there's both this aspect of you you might not think certain sins are serious. Like for example, eating fruit from a tree. Like uh let's say God gave you a specific revelation and he spoke to you and he was like, Chuck, um, I'm giving you a, a new commandment. Um, don't eat fruit from your apple tree outside because uh, if you do, it's going to plague you and your entire family. And you're like, that, you know, my apple tree is good for eating. I'm, I'm still going to eat from it. I, I think God's bluffing. <laughs> well, you can't differentiate good from evil until you see both, you know. Mm -hmm. And after they ate the fruit, now they understood the warning, you know, that you will surely die mm -hmm. is, you know, it doesn't mean instantly you're going to fall down and not live anymore. You're spiritually, you're going to. Yeah, die. we talked about that. You know, yeah, you're you're being separated from my presence. And they understood they had knowledge of good and evil then because they had done evil and they realized, yeah. I don't want any ownership. I don't want nothing to do with this, you know. So when uh, God asked him, what have you done? <laughs> yeah. Not me, it's her, you know. You, you made this woman and she tricked me into, you know, uh, giving in and eating the fruit, you know, and all this. Nobody wanted to own. 
the consequences of what they'd done, you know. Yeah, there was no sign that they necessarily would have died before. But when they did, I'm sure there was a moment of fear because a ticking time bomb to their eventual death began that day. And like that had to have also been yeah, a scary thing to also have, have faced like, you know, we not only ruined this, but as you mentioned, for our children and all of their children, like everyone who's going to come after us. And we may, we may think that, you know, our little disobedience, like my little lie isn't going to really make much of an impact or, uh, you know, like I, I cheated on my wife, but you know, or, you know, I, I was just looking at stuff online and committing like virtual adultery and cheating on her that way. But that's not a big deal because, you know, everyone does it. And uh, like, plus, I'm not going to tell her so no one will find out. But obviously, sin has ramifications that go beyond what we usually think like uh adam and eve's did and Cain's is about to like he's also going to affect everyone who's gonna come from his line and we'll talk about that um so if there's an invisible angel writing down every single thought and word that comes out of us and uh we're gonna give an account of that one day you know there's that to yeah. take into consideration you know yeah that, uh, Nothing that you think or say or do mm. is unimportant because it will come up, yeah, and you'll have to explain yourself, you know, yeah, because God is the judge, and it does say that we'll have to give an account for our life mm. and the things that we did, and it's true that when you're you're in a a courtroom, you're going to be pressed for every single ounce of the truth. And it's going to come out, and you'll be fairly judged. And if you're fairly judged and you're innocent, then that's a great thing. <laughs> like, like that's the most relieving thing. It might be scary to face God, <laughs> like face to face, even though you know it's a good thing. But at the same time, for those who know that they don't have any way to explain away what they've done or or if that's you today, that's something so important to consider the fact that you'll have to face the one who made everything, the one who knew what Adam and Eve did before they did wrong, like the one who knew Cain was going to do something wrong even before he did it, like all the times and and obviously, if you're alive and breathing and listening to this, it means that, you know, things aren't over for you and we all still have a chance while we're alive. And so, you know, the question is, even though it's not asking it in here, the the Bible is obviously getting at bigger things than just like what it's trying to say here. It's not just a story to be like, okay, that was a good novel. You know, it's it's always been used, um, even in scripture's word itself, like for instructions and building us up as people, helping us to grow. So even though it's not telling us what we should learn, there's still a moral of the story here. And if you're let's say down today or you have anger or people have seen stuff on your face or you've noticed something on your own face and you've been living with that and allowing or making excuses to stay in the kind of attitude and state that you're in it's very worth considering listening to god if he has anything to say to you because like as as I mentioned, and like like God mentioned here, it might only be a, you might only be a few steps away from doing something very irre, irrevocable, like Cain did with murdering his brother. He can't ever take that back or make it right or 
like, crud, I messed up. Can I bring my brother back? Yeah, unmurder him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no way to unmurder yeah. your murder victim. Yeah. And, um, like, even if, if you need money, but you're thinking of robbing a, a store tonight, don't do it. You can't take it back you you can um that i mean that's one of those things you you can return the money but at the same time take god's warning ahead of time and and don't make that mistake there's obviously the ability to turn around and do what cain didn't do and say like all right god all right i'm i'm gonna you know drop my anger i'm gonna drop this frown i have on my face and i'm gonna say like i'm just gonna come real to you and say i'm i'm sorry you know like i i could have done better and so i'm gonna well his, his rational it. rationale is insane you know cain is uh well you know here i didn't do what god asked me to do and i feel really bad about it and here's my brother who did do what god asked him to do and I know my way out of this situation is to murder my brother, you know. I mean, just, I, the math on that doesn't work. How does that add yeah. up as far as, as dealing with your mm. uh, feelings of, uh, of being disrespected or whatever and, you know, God not accepting your offering? How does that, mm. how, how, how do you even imagine that's going to do anything to yeah. help that, you know? It's just, just, this, just this pure jealousy, hatred, rage, you know, that... Somebody else got a pat on the head while well, you didn't, you know, so I'm, I'm going to murder them and that'll make everything all right. You know? Yeah. There's definitely a lot of mentality of that out here in Rockford where we live and uh, oh, yeah. out here in Rockford, Everywhere. Illinois. Um, yeah, all, all over the world, obviously. Um, but it's a, a pretty rough city in certain parts and like the the murder rates are sadly higher than a lot of places around here uh there's constant families being broken apart uh people committing uh, adulterous acts uh with people left and right uh fathers mothers walking away uh from their partners uh leaving their children uh some of them having them taken away because they're getting in trouble themselves. So much drug, uh, alcohol, um, or I should say like drunkenness, uh, that goes on so many, um, just, uh, all of these things stem from bad mindsets. And, and like you were saying, like, obviously the, those bad calculations were from being in a bad frame of mind. Like he wasn't, when we have a frown on our face, it physically disables our brain from being able to go to good logical thinking. Like when we are panicking, like we don't have the rationale to make good decisions. And even when we're anxious, especially as a recovery specialist, and, and you even know this, Chuck, from... um also doing some of this uh, research and going through programs yourself that when we become anxious or when we have desires that start building up in our body, it goes to our brain and our limbic system and it sets off the flight or fight, flight or fight response yeah. or flee. <laughs> and for you to say, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And it causes like increased heart rates. It also closes off the frontal cortex of the brain from that being the part that makes a lot of our logical, rational decisions. And here we can see Cain obviously isn't thinking clearly. Like he just has rage and like it seems as if his heart is racing and he's having these horrible upsetting downward thoughts and the only way to stop that sort of thing is to humble ourselves to take it down a notch and to be able to relax and listen to what god is saying instead of just ignoring it and keep racing past all of the warning signs well as i said earlier uh, we read as sin is crouching at the door and is eager to control you 
All right. Mm. And that's that's where, you know, Cain allowed that to happen. He allowed, you know, sin. And and Peter restates this, this scenario in, in his line about uh, Satan is like a hungry lion prowling about seeking, uh, and I'll interject my own adjectives here, weak and wavering Christians whom he may devour, you know. And if you've ever watched on TV these, you know, animal shows that show the lions hunting, that's, they they look at a herd of uh, antelope, say, oh, there's the biggest, strongest, fastest one. Let's go after him. No, they look at the little wobbly newborn or this sick one that's got a bad leg or something, you know. Yeah. There's our meal. You know, they know who to go after. It's the the weak, the young, and the wounded and stuff. And and that applies to in Christ. If you're weak and young and wounded, uh, one of those three categories, and you're claiming to be a Christian, Satan's got an eye out for you, and he's going to put you on the dinner menu and yeah. tear you apart, you know, because uh, you're going to let him. Yeah. You know, and he knows it. Yeah? And that's the way it works. So, uh, you know, you are given counsel in Scripture, put on the armor of God, you know. Become a soldier of God, you know, skillful in the use of your armor and your weapons, you know. Then you're going to be able to withstand in the day of evil. If you try and do it during the day of evil, you're toast. You, yeah. you can't do it, you know. You can't put on the armor of God, which you don't even know how to use in the day of evil, and vanquish the enemy. You, you're going down, you know. And that's not a message of no hope. It's a message of hope because you can win the battle, but you have to be prepared for it. And yeah. The day of preparation is right now, you know. Today, you know, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. Study what the armor of God is and what it requires of you and do it. You yeah. Know, right? Absolutely. You know, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith. Get yeah. these things working in your life. Yeah. You have, oh, Chuck, oh, oh uh, Michael, how do I do that? Well, a good place to start is just reading the scripture. Uh, start anywhere. You know, New Testament's good. Start in the New Testament and continually be asking God to guide you and give you wisdom so you understand what the Scripture is saying to you personally as, as if it was God wrote you a letter and here it is in this book and you're reading it. And what are you saying to me, God? What do you want me to do, God? Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it doesn't matter what it says that Michael and Chuck should do. It matters what you should do in response to what God says. We can guide you and tell you what we did to help you figure out what you might want to do. But I don't know what you need. God does. And that's the beautiful thing. And he's willing to help you and teach you and give you anything you need to withstand against the the evil in this world and to resist sin. Definitely. Even and to the point of dying in your behalf, you know. So, you know, if you, how far is God willing to go? That's how far he's willing to go. Yeah. When you were bringing up the scripture that was quoted in the new testament about the lion waiting to pounce yes. i was taking a look at what it was saying here with cain and the term actually is basically lying or stretching out and if you think about it that's what a lion does it's not like it's just like at first, I was thinking uh, crouching, but when it put in those terms, it makes sense. You know, a lion doesn't just crouch over like a human. It kind of lays flat out. It stretches itself and it hides itself below the grass so that it can't be seen and it gets as close as possible. It keeps sneaking up. So if you are in target range, of a lion the worst thing you can do is keep staying there and if you know if the frown on his face if the anger building was the issue that god was trying to point out like hey your anger is boiling it's about to explode the worst thing you can do is keep the anger and stay there because he said it's waiting it's lying it's creeping closer and it's about to attack and control you. 
Yeah, you're right. Uh, it says he's prowling about, so he's 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 sneaking around looking at uh, you know the herd, looking for a weak one that he can that he can take down and get. And when he spots you, okay, that's like you said, that's when he starts coming forward and, you know, their bellies like dragging on the ground the way they, they slink through the grass. And if you look their way, they freeze, you know, they, yeah. and they're camouflaged. They blend into the, the surroundings, you know, then, then you look away, you start chewing your cut again or whatever, you know, this little, little animal does. Yeah. The lion starts creeping ever closer. Yeah. Until and it's, it's in range of, you know, all it has to do is spring, and it's got you. Even if you see it and try and get away, you're not going to make it. It's too late. You know? Yeah, and it says there that it desires you, like it's craving you, just like the man and the woman were craving the fruit. So they're like, "I gotta go for it. I gotta get this fruit if it's gonna like, if it's gonna help give me God level powers. You know, I want this." Like it sounds like a good deal the serpent's offering me. I'm I'm gonna take it. It looks good for food. It also sounds good to my ear, like the the benefits of it. Yeah, yeah. But at kind the of like, time, remember them old old school commercials where uh, Sylvester would look at Tweety and in his mind's eye he'd see like this oh. platter with a roasted turkey on mm. or something. You know, <laughs> yep. I'm gonna be eating that bird in a moment here. Uh, and you know the the devil anticipates our fall, and sadly, unfortunately, most of the time he's right, you know, yeah, and the last thing is it talks about obviously the seriousness of sin here, like God is we've been talking about is trying to warn us from sinning, but Take that seriously that whatever sin that you're struggling with either currently or that you're being tempted with that's crouching at your door, like even if it might not seem like a big deal, God wants you to know that it is as dangerous as a lion. Yeah. And the thing is, I'm sure you've seen people in your life, or maybe you've been someone, um, and I don't know if uh, you want to speak anything on this um, yourself, Chuck, but uh, like working uh, with guys who have gone through addictions and even going through some, uh, to be blunt with all of you, um, some virtual sexual addictions myself through my past, like it says here, like, why why worry about the sin that's waiting and crouching or stretching out like a lion and ready to pounce on you? Because it says that it's eager to control you. And it's the same word that's used for like how we're supposed to rule over the animals and like to take care of them. But there is obviously a really negative aspect to that. Like it's not necessarily going to eat you your desires or your bad cravings that you have for stuff that's not good for you or other people around you might not eat you up right away. But like I can speak from experience and I think you can too, Chuck. And I, you know, everyone who's listening to this that our desires, if we let them go wild and we let sin go and we let it get at us, that it controls and, and turns us into monsters. Like that's what it does is it says right here that like the end result is being controlled. And I can say like I, I've been a totally different person and sometimes i've wonder like how in the world did i even do some of the acts that i did in my past like it was almost like i was being controlled by some other kind of personality or like some other kind of person or thing and like that's what scripture calls as sin it's something that's both inside of us but it's also 
something that is foreign in one sense to us, like it's outside of us waiting to jump and and attack and take control of our life. And I know that that's what has happened in my life. And I don't know if you want to speak anything to that, Chuck. I, I would kind of add, you know, that sin, once it is committed, becomes a real thing. It's a, it's like a substance. It may be invisible. You can't necessarily put it in a test tube and weigh it or something, but it's a real thing and it has to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, if, if you've ever observed on, on TV when uh, a lion or a pack of lions uh, uh, take down an animal, it's, I mean, it's vicious. You know, one, one lion usually grabs the, the critter by the throat and mm-hmm. the other ones start ripping its flesh apart while it's still alive. It hasn't even died yeah. yet. They're just re- literally tearing mm-hmm. it to pieces, yeah. eating it up, you know. And, you know, obviously, if you commit sin, you don't instantly physically die. Yeah. But spiritually. And it says die. rule or dominate. Like the lion's goal is to dominate the other animal, to get on top of it, to get under it, to rip its flesh apart to slowly take it down so that eventually it goes limp. So in other words, you know, Satan destroys you spiritually. Yeah. And that doesn't mean the end of you. There is a pathway to healing from that. But you have to take that pathway. You know, if you just disregard that sin and just put it away, Mm -hmm. it's not going to go away. It's always going to be there. And it's always going to separate you from all that you could be and realize as a Christian walking in Christ until you deal with it. Yeah. And that wraps up with the very last thing is God even gave him a solution. He said, but you must subdue it. Yeah. It's a, it is a thing, you know, it's, it's something that's real tangible uh, in a spiritual sense even though it's not in the physical sense, but it's something very real that as a human being, you have to come to grips with and do something about it. And on your own devices, you know, that is just a a trap, a deception that Satan throws out there that you somehow can work it out on your own. You can't, you know. Yeah, you need to listen to God. Yeah, yeah. He, He has the solution for you. You have to be humble, though, and admit, hey, I'm just a human being. I I need your help, God. Yeah. You know, that's what he wants us to to do is just admit that we need him. Absolutely. Irregardless of what we've ever done, if we admit that we need him, he's there for us. Yeah. And that goes for anyone, even... If you happen to be a successful business owner listening to this today or thinking about other people in your field that have said, or uh, even if something you've been thinking recently is that there's not really as much of a need or a need for God for you specifically because of the fact that you have everything all under control, like you're getting successful results, you're staying out of trouble, at least, you know, legally. There's all of these things that we do even in in small sort of ways like we were talking about, you know, you hurt your family, you do something under the table that you know isn't right and it's going to affect someone in the future. You know, we've all done stuff that's messed up and is going to harm ourselves and or other people. And as you mentioned, even if you got away with doing slick stuff at some point in your life, you're going to have to answer God about it one day. You're going to be called into the principal's office or, you know, the, the ultimate judge's office one day or his court. And think of you if everything in your life is behind a two way mirror. All you see is your own reflection in the mirror, but God is on the other side of the mirror watching everything in your life. Everything. Everything. Not 
just a lot of things, everything. There's nothing in you that he doesn't know. Yeah. Nothing, you know, he knows everything. So it's, but it's up to us to, uh, you know, I love my hat, you know, uh, uh, forgiven. It says First uh, John 1, 9, you know, if we confess our sins, big word, if there, if we confess our sins, yeah. he's faithful and just, he'll forgive our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, you know, yeah. if we don't confess, the other part's not going to happen. He doesn't overrule our will. If you if you take anything away from today, take that away. God is a perfect gentleman and a respecter of our free will. Absolutely. If you will to hold on to sin, he's going to let you do it. Because that's what he said, you know. He's created us with free will. We can choose to obey or disobey. Yeah. And the end result of it, as we've read in both the story before this with Adam and Eve, and now with Cain, it results always in death. And that's always the spiritual results of our wrongs. And there is a way to reverse and correct that with God. And that's actually what we call repentance, which does mean to actually turn things around, to change your mind, and to also change your actions in your life, and to begin believing and trusting and becoming confident and following what God has to say. And that's what these stories are teaching us, is that it would have been better to follow God's way. It's not necessarily saying that word for word and yet at the same time kind of like we talked about in some of the intro stuff it doesn't teach it like children's sunday school where it's like okay now kids what can we take away from this lesson what is what is god trying to teach you it leaves you to interpret it but that's why we're having this podcast to help you think about it there is something really important for all of us to take away and that's why scripture and god's word here is for everyone it goes for everyone from any walk of life you know no matter what your experience is we can all relate with this story here because like this is the story of humanity here that we're reading this is our origins like these are the lessons that other people learned and that other godly people in the past thought were worth putting down and communicating so that future people like us can learn from them. Mm -hmm. It's uh, for our benefit. And I said, always look at scripture like it's, uh, you know, God wrote a letter directly to you. You know, it's don't deflect it away. It applies to everybody else, but not me. In reality, it applies only to you. What everybody else does, that's up to them. All that matters is what you react to what you read in the scripture. You know? Yep, absolutely. So with that, we're going to leave everything for next week talking about what ends up happening to Cain after he commits murder on his brother and exactly what comes of that and the results and punishment uh even kind of reflecting some things back as we've been talking a million times to adam and eve it's almost like a parallel story in some senses not one for one but i'm really thankful chuck that you spent the time uh and um well, thanks a, for inviting me to be here. It's, it's always fun to sit around and talk about these great topics, you know. And yeah, uh, it, it's not a hopeless situation at all. But as a matter of fact, it is all about hope. You know, God has has given us hope in the in the person of His Son Christ Jesus, who who uh, who's brought a remedy for all that ails us. You know, and it's just a a matter of waking up enough to realize that. Uh, there's something wrong and I need the cure and the cure is here and available right now. 
and that is found only in one thing, and that is found in Christ Jesus. So uh, if you haven't uh, invited Christ to be the king of your life, um, you know, that that's kind of my closing word here is, you know, open your heart today. Right now, today is the time to do it. That's, uh, it's not wise to put this off until later because uh, um, I've seen this uh, over and over again in my life of 69 years. We don't know what time we got left, you know. So don't put this off, you know. Now, while he's pulling at your heart, is the time to open the door to your heart and say, come in, Jesus, you know. Let's let's feast together, like it says in Revelation. Uh, uh, he stands at the door knocking, hoping that you'll open the door so he can come in and we can feast together. You know? Yeah, and don't fellowship. open the door on sin, but open the door to God. Yeah. Yeah. Sin will trick you and deceive you to opening a door to your heart, but Christ doesn't do that, you know. He stands at the door, perfect gentleman, knocking, waiting for you to respond, you know. And it's up to you. Uh, if today you hear that knocking sound at the door to your heart, don't fight it. Don't put it off. Just open it up and receive him today. Hey, I'm so glad you guys could join for today's podcast. I hope things clicked for you and that you're able to better understand God's word. Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So keep on listening to what God has to say, and I'll see you guys next time. God bless.